Hey gang, it is Wednesday. That means it is time to spend just a few minutes talking about the Bible. We have been talking for the last few weeks about uh, the nature of God, a very particular aspect of the nature of God that is rooted in Exodus. But um, as we're going to start to see in the next few weeks, uh, goes throughout the entire Bible. I'm pulling my Bible app up as we're talking, so uh, forgive me as I try to multitask. Um, this particular aspect of God's character that we're looking at is rooted in the Exodus narrative. Um, there's this thing that he ties in in the narrative to what it means to call himself the I Am, the God who is present. Uh, Jehovah or Yahweh is tied to his name. And that is, again and again in the Exodus story, that uh, this notion of him being present is the notion that God hears the cry of those who are oppressed coming out of the darkness and the brokenness of the world. He answers that cry uh, and brings liberation from that. That's the story of the Exodus. And in many ways, the Exodus shapes the story of the rest of the Bible. And so um, I've been trucking along with this, and uh, you can go back and listen to the first two segments where we focus mostly on Exodus in the series. But I'm trucking along with this, getting ready to go into some other text and it hits me that we might want to back up just for a few minutes and punt um, and talk about some of the things that kind of underlie um, a lot of the parts of this story that we've been telling so for instance what we want to talk about today and this should catch us back up to speed so that we're ready to jump back out into uh, the rest of the Bible next week is that um, we want to spend some time talking about what it means to um, to sin or to be sinned against or what it means to say that someone is crying out of the darkness in their moment of oppression these sorts of things that we've been talking about we want to talk about all of those terms and kind of provide some sort of biblical framework for how we understand those so that we understand what it is God is doing because what we're going to find and we've hinted at this before but what we're going to find is that um we will see God doing this not just in the Exodus but throughout the biblical narrative and the insinuation as we come to the end is that this is what God does in history uh, when God is present and we serve not the God of the past or the future but we serve the God who is present what he does is he um, does this Exodus sort of thing and so we want to understand clearly what it is he's doing because he's still doing it and uh, we want to understand what he's doing because we want to wrestle with what it means to follow a God who has this as an essential part of his character. He hears this cry, he answers the cry, he brings liberation to those who are oppressed. And so to give a little clarity, what we're going to do today is we're going to back up and we're going to look at um, primarily in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 this notion of sin and we're going to kind of unpack it a little bit um, and the reason we want to do this is because what we're going to do next week is we're going to end up in Genesis chapter 4 which outside of Exodus is actually where this theme that we're noticing in the book of Exodus where God ties his nature as the God who is present together with his action in history to redeem those who are oppressed this is where that theme starts um, give you a hint in Genesis chapter 4 as Abel's blood cries out from the ground after Cain kills him. So I want to make sure that we understand um, what we're getting into there. And so as we go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we want to talk about sin. Not, and I'm not going to give you a comprehensive definition. and We're not going to do anything as simple as saying, you know, as you've probably heard growing up, um, you know, sin is missing the mark, that sort of thing. Uh, rather, what I want to do is I want to give you a variety of angles from which we can view uh, the notion of sin as it's presented in the Bible. It's kind of a multifaceted sort of thing. And so we want to wrestle with the brokenness of our world and all of its complexity. So then we can turn around and wrestle with how God is working in the brokenness of the world and all of its complexity. And so um, the way we want to start, and we'll do this a couple of different ways. The way we want to start is we want to um, the highlight, for instance, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, um, that there are three basic kinds of uh, characters in the Genesis story. And when we understand how these three basic kinds of characters in the Genesis creation account works, that's going to um, help us understand how uh, 
on a fundamental level, sin works. And so the first character in the story is obviously God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so God is an active player throughout this entire story. As a matter of fact, God is the main character in Scripture. We oftentimes assume it's about us. It's really a story about God. Um, we relate to him as a part of that, but it's about him. So God is the main character in this story. And then there is, on the other side of this, this whole host of creation that God forms and molds and shapes and establishes and gives life and function to in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And the emphasis uh, again and again is, and kind of the obvious conclusion is, uh, there is God and then there's all of this other stuff and all this other stuff is not God. But within this creation, there are um, a particular set of characters that come up uh, time and again. And in Hebrew, they're what you would refer to as um, nefesh haya, and they are living creatures, or we might call them the uh, precise theological and scientific term for nefesh haya, critters. Okay. And so there is, um, in the story, there is God, and then there are the nefesh haya, the critters, and this is a broad-ranging term that um, that applies to all of the living creatures. He applies it to the birds and the fish and the animals and so on and so forth. In Genesis chapter 2, he even applies it to humans. We are nefesh haya in the same way that the birds and the fish, we are critters in the same way that the birds and the fish and the animals and the creepy crawlies are. Um, but in... Our creation in 26, 27, and 28 of Genesis chapter 1, a third category is introduced. And the difference between uh, humankind, which is the category that's going to be introduced, and the rest of the Nefesh Hayah is not in their physical makeup. It is not as if there's some sort of intrinsic thing about us that is necessarily different than the rest of the critters. Uh, just like them, from dust we have come, and to dust we will return all those sorts of things. We are created, formed by God. We are not God, all of those sorts of things, but we were created with a particular vocation. And so in Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27, and 28, uh, the text says, uh, and it emphasizes rather clearly, that we were created to bear the image of God. And in the ancient world and in Genesis chapter 1, the way that functions is um, that we were created to represent God in his creation. Uh, being God's image bearer, being made in the image of God, is not uh, a statement about how we are made, but what we are made for. And so he'll say, you know, now let us create humankind, male and female, we will create humankind and they will bear our image. And then he created humankind. And, and then he says in verse 28, that's kind of a summary of verse 26 and 27, then he says in verse 28, in conjunction with this creating us in his image, he says, now be fruitful, um, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish and the birds and the critters and the creepy crawlies. And so it's, it's this function that we've been given. And so in the scheme of things, what we find to kind of move along instead of just spending a lot of time talking about this one thing, in the scheme of things, what we find is that in the Genesis creation narrative there is God there's this vast array of critters who are not God and then there are humans and in one sense they're critters but in another sense they have been established to be more than critters they've been established to represent God and um, humans that is because of the vocation we've been given we have this tension rightfully so when things are working the way they're supposed to we have this tension that exists from not quite being God, but not quite being just like the rest of the critters. We've been placed in between. Um, we are lower than God, but we represent him, and we are uh, made of dust, and we'll return to dust like the rest of the Nefesh Hayah, but we have been given dominion over them. And so rightfully placed, we have this, this place that we exist where we have one foot in kind of the realm of the divine as we try to represent God in his creation. We have one foot in the realm of the Nefesh Hayah, and um, we kind of exist in between. And so one way of talking about sin, and this is where kind of that missing the mark definition from uh, your old sermons about the Greek word for sin comes into play. Um, one way of talking about sin is to say that we sin when we kind of forget ourselves and we get that tension 
out of balance. And so if you think about it, um, this works for a lot of sins. We're going to oversimplify here, but um, this works for a lot of sins. One of the ways that you can talk about sin is that we forget ourselves and either we, we reach too high and um, we try to act as if we were gods or we forget ourselves and we reach too low and we act as if we are nothing but critters. And if you go through and you start thinking about um, a variety of sins that we struggle with on a regular basis, sins like pride or uh, vanity or lust or anger and anger expressing itself in sinful ways, um, these are manifestations of us forgetting our place. These are manifestations of us being placed in this tension between the divine and the nefesh hayah and creation and God calling that very good, but we get that out of whack. That tension gets out of balance and we either go too far toward um, the divine and we uh, presume too much about ourselves. Or, uh, on the other hand, we kind of forget who we are and uh, pretend as if we're nothing but critters and we presume too little about ourselves. And so there's this balance that we've been created in. And sin, from the very earliest, uh, was kind of a way of talking about getting out of balance from who we are. We forget who we are. And part of this kind of an underlying thing, part of this stems from a very high view of humanity. We have this saying, and if you've been around me for very long, you've heard me talk about this before. We have this this saying where when we mess up or we do something wrong or we get we get something wrong, we say, oh, well, after all, I'm only human. Um, and that is, um, to be frank, that is a way of degrading what God has created and calling it very good. The problem when we sin, uh, the problem when we mess up is not that we are only human. The problem is that when we sin, we have forgotten our humanity. Because God created us as humans. He created us in that tension between the rest of creation and himself to represent him. And um, when we lose sight of that, that's when things go awry. It's because we've become less than human. Or we presume that we're more than human uh, when things get messed up. And so um, we kind of start with this balance. And what spirals out of control from there? Let me give you a couple of examples. Since we're in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, these are kind of the examples that I'll return to um, again and again and again. Um, in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve and Adam are tempted and partake of the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, the very explicit claim that Satan makes is that if you eat this fruit, then you will be like God. And, and it said that it looked good and it looked like it was tasty. And they desired to be like God. And so whatever the particular historical details are of this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the fall and the entrance of sin into the world, uh, what we have happening on a base level is Adam and Eve forgetting themselves and they reach too far, they presume too much, they want to be um, like God in a sense that was um, not healthy. They wanted to be something other than what they were. And so uh, we see there that, that overreaching. But in the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 4, this is when Cain and Abel are bringing their sacrifices to God, and Abel's sacrifice is cool, and Cain's sacrifice is um, not for whatever reason. Cain gets angry about it, and the Lord describes to him uh, this notion of sin as if it's an animal crouching outside of the door, and it will devour him. And um, we see as Cain lashes out in anger against his brother, presuming that that would fix the problem. Um, we see him giving in to these just kind of instinctual, emotional urges. He, he becomes just like a, an animal in doing that. And so he presumes too little about himself. You can see how this sort of stuff plays out. Um, so that's one way of looking at all of this. Now I want to back up. I want to approach it from a different way. I'm just giving you different facets of a multifaceted gym here as we we talk about all of this. Um, another way of looking at it is to to talk about the various dynamics. Um, the modern American church, for a whole host of reasons, not all of those reasons are bad and not all of those reasons are good, we tend to focus on personal sin. One of the reasons, I guess, is because we're super individualistic. We don't really think in corporate terms, uh, which is funny for a religion that is built upon, you know, 
uh, Jesus, whose second greatest command was love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, but we think about sin in a super individualistic terms, and we think about sin in terms of being guilty. And so um, we talk about how I have sinned, and I have done something wrong, and God forgives me of my sins. And um, I want to affirm that that is certainly a part of the equation here. So in Genesis chapter 3, we see that Adam and Eve make a decision to rebel against God. They make a decision to go against what they were created to be. They got out of whack. They messed up that tension. They forgot who they were. And because of that choice, they did something that made them guilty. And so all of that talk that we have in the modern American church of I am a sinner and I am guilty and God is forgiving me of my sins. All of that stuff is certainly true, but that's only half the story. And um, sometimes this other half of the story is missed as we... Uh, talk about sin in the modern modern American church. And so long as we're missing this other half of the story, we're not going to understand what's going on in places like Exodus and what God is doing in places like that. Um, the other half of the story is that also, as um, I forget myself and I sin and you forget yourself and you sin and so on and so forth throughout all of humanity, throughout all of history, ad nauseum, um, what happens is there's this second category that exists in sin, which says that uh, not only do I sin and I am guilty, but also I am sinned against. And I am, in that sense, a victim of it. And so in um, Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they make a decision and they are guilty of um, whatever comes with that. They rebelled against God. But by the time you come to Genesis chapter 4, this is only one generation out of sin kind of coming into the world, letting death into the world. You have Cain who takes Abel out into a field and murders him and buries him. And um, that is the first instance of um, this notion that we're going to see in Scripture that sin is not only something I do, but sin is something that happens to me. Sin is not only something I am guilty of, but sometimes sin is... Uh, something I am a victim of. And both of these dynamics, they both I do sin and I have sin happen to me, both of these things are true. And so um, one of the things that we want to reckon with as we go through the Bible is that God is looking at this fully developed picture of sin where it's not just me doing things that's really just between me and God and it's not anybody else's business. And he offers my personal sins, um, offers me forgiveness, personal forgiveness from my personal sins, and it's really no um, no business of yours. But he has this full-orbed picture of sin where he wants to address my personal sins, but he also wants to address those sins that add up over time. And so what we have as um, I go into the world sinning and being sinned against, and you go into the world sinning and being sinned against, we have this, um, this way of being in the world develop. Uh, this complex interaction between my rebellion and the rebellion of others in which everything is just broken. And rather than fixing just one half of that equation, God is interested in fixing the entirety of the equation. And so um, by the time we come to Exodus, for instance, this is clearly what's at play. God is not coming in Exodus to redeem Israel of their sins. Now, there's no question that they were sinners. Um, we're not arguing that they weren't sinners. But in the Exodus narrative, what God is doing is he's coming to redeem Israel from Egypt's sin. He is coming to set them free of the thing that Egypt is doing to them. Um... And so one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that God always is going to deal with um, the sins that we commit, and God is always going to deal with the sins that are committed against us. We can't just take half of this equation on either side, and there are movements in the world today that, that want to pretend as if there's nothing but personal sin, and there are movements in the world that want to pretend as if there's nothing but corporate sin uh, kind of a systematic sin, uh, we have to be the people who acknowledge and deal with and follow the God who cares about both of those things. We are sinners who are sinned against. We are at times guilty, 
and we are at other times victims. And we are all caught up in this world where uh, just the preponderance of all of the sins that are bouncing around, those that we commit and those that have been committed against us, we, we now have this world where all roads lead to death. And this is kind of what's going on in Genesis chapter 3. Um, in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, which is where uh, the creation narrative talks about this, the problem isn't really sin. The problem is that sin opens the door for death. It's not to say that sin is good. Think of, think of a coin, two sides, you can't separate them. Um, but sin opens the door to death because sin draws us away from God. In rebelling against God, they rejected God. They were cast out of the garden. Uh, but before Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden at the end of Gen Genesis chapter 3, they had already, in a sense, left God. They turned their back on him. And when you turn your back on the source of life, all that's left is death. And that is the problem that we're going against here. And God is, God is at all times and all ways opposed to death in the world. I, I love this text in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, this is where Paul is talking about resurrection there. Paul says that death is God's enemy and that it will be defeated. And then you come down to the end of that chapter and it says that sin is the sting of death, but Christ has defeated death in the cross and his resurrection. Um, so all of these dynamics are at play. And so when we come into a situation where, um, like Exodus, there's a group of people who are being sinned against, and they are just in this morass of brokenness and darkness and things are going wrong and all ends and they're finding the short end of the stick as far as all of this goes. And they cry out of that darkness. God reveals himself to be the one who hears those who cry out of the darkness. And so that's where we're picking up. Um, as we do that, we want to pay attention to what God is doing. We want to ask ourselves um, one more time. Just I'm, I'm at the end now, so I'm just kind of reminding you of what we're doing. We want to ask ourselves, um, what does it mean or what does it look like to follow this God revealed to us, not only in Exodus, but in Genesis 4 and on through the entire Bible, we're going to trace it through. What does it look like to follow this God? The God who cares not only about my personal sins, but the ways that I'm sinned against, who doesn't want to bring me liberation just from my personal sins, but also uh, from those ways that we have created this thing that is bigger than us. Uh, that leads us to death, regardless of how good we may be. Uh, what does it look like to follow this sort of God? Now, just by way of reminder, I think it's probably obvious this is pre-recorded. Uh, we're not doing this live, but you can leave comments in the uh, comment section below. You can text, you can message. If you're sending me something on Facebook Messenger, just by the way, I, um, for the most part, I'm not on Facebook right now. I check in about twice a week, usually when I upload this and when I upload the sermon on Sunday morning. Uh, but I will eventually get that, and we will we will have a conversation. So if you have questions, if you have comments, additions, subtractions, complaints, compliments, whatever you got, uh, drop it on me as we go through, and um, we will continue exploring this together. Okay, guys, I just wanted to hit that uh, brief interlude to back up and talk about that just for a few minutes, and that was just kind of a quick summary. We could spend weeks talking on this, but I didn't want to do that. And uh, we will pick up from here next week and start to look at this theme as it develops through the Bible. I hope you guys have a good time, good week. Take it easy, y'all.